We are going to make our own psalm of worship to the Lord. You will need pens, pencils, sharpie, anything, something that you can write with. Okay, maybe they don't have to be laid out that neat. A Bible, something to cut and stick with. Paint if you have it, ribbon or string, anything that you see lying around the house. And then you need some scraps of paper, some newspaper, postcards, photos, maybe there's some leaflets and flyers around you. Grab things that when you see, they remind you of God or you see elements of God in them and who he is to you. The Psalms are beautifully poetries filled with metaphors, symbols, pictures, imagination, colour, fragrance, pain, joy and love. They offer portraits of hope, light and joy. They're a lifetime worth of reading that we can often make our own. We are going to make our own psalm of worship to the Lord. Start looking at what you have and start placing them and seeing what can come out of them. So for mine, I've cut out this word above and I've got this red ribbon that is just really bold. Um, and then I've got the green, which is just a really warm color. And then I have this CD, I love music and music to me offers lots of hope. And I also get that hope from God as well. So what you need to do is rearrange these things and then see what words come up from them. So for mine, I got the keywords hope, warmth, connected, above and bloom. This postcard with the beautiful flowers on just reminds me of the flourishing that can happen when you're close with God. And so I've turned that into my own little mini psalm, which reads, The Lord is my hope. I feel his warmth and boldness. We are always connected. He is above all my doubts and his love always blooms. So what have you made? See what comes up. You don't have to write it. You can use the pictures just like the Psalms to reflect a metaphor or a shape or something that really stirs in your heart. Um, and then I've ended with a prayer just connected to what I've kind of got from the psalm that I've made. And it says, thank you, Lord, that you are our hope. Thank you that your warmth envelops us. Thank you that through Jesus, you are close. May you remain above all in my life. May your love continue to bloom and yield in my life for the benefit of others and to your glory. Amen. So have a go. It's really, really easy. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just grab what's around you, put it together and just see what you can come up with that really reflects um, who God is to you. Have a listen again to Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. In the presence of Almighty God, so be
Father, such boundless grace. 
and welcome to St V's. I'm Adrian Clark. I'm the church planning curate here. I'm Ros Hall. I'm normally around in the morning service and I'm also church warden. Great to be here. And how are you doing Ros? Yeah I'm really well thank you. I always, I always love Sunday morning. I love sort of getting back together with people and seeing you all on the screen. It's wonderful. So good isn't it? It's great to see you. You've not been so around so much recently. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Well, as, as many of you know, I'm starting a church plant in Collindale. It's been absolutely manic, but it's great fun, really exciting. But it's also great to be here for a, a, a back again at St. B's and being seen. So it's really exciting. And we've got a really great morning lined up for people. So I'm really excited to see where things are going. Ros, why don't you open up in prayer for us? Mm, thanks, Adrian. Let's just take a moment just to be quiet, still ourselves. And then yeah. I'm going to open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together again today. We thank you for this opportunity to join together online to worship you, to pray together and to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to each one of us, that you would um, speak to us not only in our heads, but also in our heart. And I pray that you would um, prompt us to action. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So now we're going over to the worship where we've got Carol doing some creative worship for us. We've got Coco and Chris who are leading us in worship, followed by Andy with the prayers. Today we are looking at Psalm 46. This psalm praises God for being a source of power and salvation in times of trouble and encourages us to have faith in the Lord when it seems like things are falling apart. But Romans 8.18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. We are going to reflect on the psalm. Think of any words or phrases that come to mind as I read it. If you wish, you can create a poem from these words. Now write your words or poem on a piece of paper or card. You can decorate this and hang it on your wall to remind yourself to always have faith in God. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war seas to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I will now read my example. I chose one word for each verse of the psalm, but you can have as many as you like. The Lord is my protector and with him I am brave. I have faith in him that he will pick me up when I fall, and when we are in trouble, his voice will roar. The Lord is always close, the Holy Spirit within us. We are in awe and wonder of his glorious power. The beauty of nature is a never-ending reminder of his goodness. Let streams and rivers of holy water guide us to his gates in heaven, where we will feel at home. So let us meditate on his word and give him our troubles so that we may feel his warmth and everlasting love. I encourage you to continue writing your poem throughout the service. Now let's stand up and praise God together. Oh, 
precious sight, my Savior stands, dying for me with outstretched hands. Oh, precious sight, I love to gaze, remembering salvation's day, remembering salvation's day. Though my eyes linger on this scene, they passing time. Right here, my life is here, I'll be a living sacrifice. 
sacrifice for you. You refine the refiner. I want to be consumed. You refine the refiner. I want to be consumed. Yes, Lord, as Coco sung, we want to be refined by your fire. 
Lord, would many of us having more time for reflection at present, we'd ask that such time spent wouldn't be destructive, but would be an opportunity for your refining fire to reveal those areas of our lives which cause us to stumble and to empower us to remove them. Lord, in these dark days, we would ask that your light would shine out through each one of us into the communities in which we live and to everyone who crosses our path. Lord, turning our thoughts to the virus, we thank you that there's been a lifting of the lockdown and we would pray against any possible second spike as a result of that, Lord. And we look forward to a time when we can all meet together again, Lord, and worship you together in one body, in one place. We thank you that even though we are all separate in lockdown, that we are never alone, that you are always there with us. And Lord, we want to pray. We want to pray for our leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom and honesty and transparency as they look to lead us through these difficult waters. We pray for the vaccine, Lord. We pray for a vaccine that will be truly effective. And we pray for those scientists working on that now, Lord. We pray for all obstacles in their way to be removed. We pray for a vaccine that will be truly effective. And Lord, we pray for those recovering from the virus and those grieving the loss of loved ones as a result of the virus. Lord, we pray that they would know your peace and your presence. And Lord, we thank you for the NHS and all the frontline workers. And Lord, we would pray for a change in the social order as we come out of this, that these people who have kept us going through these times would be truly revered as they deserve to be and not at the bottom of the pile as they so often are. So Lord, we pray that you would go with each one of us into this coming week and we thank you that you've been with us through the past week. In your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks to you all for leading us in worship and prayers. It's really great to have so many of you here. And if you're new to our church, really warm welcome. And if you are regular, welcome back. Can I just say that if you are new, we would love to connect with you. So one way that you can do this is to fill in our online connect form. So you will see a link coming up in the chat. Or if not, you can go to the top right of your screen where there is a, a button connect with us and then fill in the online form, and then we will be able to tell you how you can get involved in the life and ministry of the church. Great. And if you are also new, there's another way of connecting is through life groups. And we have um, a whole host of different life groups with different flavors, different styles, and really encourage anybody who's a regular to the church to be a member of these life groups, because that's where family takes place. So feel free to click again on that, the links that are coming up now, and we'll introduce you to a life group. We're also going to uh, take our virtual offering now. So giving to the church is part of our worship. And so we would love to encourage you, if you aren't doing so already, to consider giving to the life and ministry of St. Bees. And again, you can do that by going to the top of your screen, the top right-hand corner and clicking on giving or following the link in the... Um, in the chat. Adrian, would you like to uh, pray for our offering at this point? Sure, we'd love to. Father, we thank you so much for all that you give us. You give us everything we need. And Father, we recognize that all of our finances are given by you to us. And so Father, we pray that you would just take this offering back to you as our thanks and our praise to you in jesus name amen amen amen, amen.
last but not least, if you're watching as a family, don't forget our um, amazing kids and families blogs. There are all sorts of resources, adults and children alike, that you can download. So look at the URL that's at the bottom of your screen and um, download those resources. And thanks to Sheree and the team who are uh, regularly providing those on a, a week by week basis. We yeah, really amazing. Thank you. Great. So now we've got a really exciting update from one of our mission partners, Pedro Santos. Pedro and his wife Anu, they run a busy retreat house in Tel Aviv in Israel. It's a guest house and um, they also lead and are responsible for three worshipping communities that operate out of that guest house. Um, Anu is also has her own counselling ministry and they have the two amazing sons, Jonathan and Daniel, who actually you will, some of you will have met at St. B's. So, Pedro, thank you so much for providing us with this update. Beit Emmanuel means the house of God with us. And indeed, God has been with us during this time. We locked our gates on the 17th of March due to the corona pandemic. And since then, we have done so many things that we normally cannot do. From spending time with God in our morning devotionals, to carrying out new projects, from deep cleaning every corner in the building, to painting and refurbishing our rooms, from rethinking the way we cook our food, to beautifying our gardens, from playing games on our free time, to taking lessons on self-defense. God has blessed us with a wonderful group of volunteers who have decided to stay and stand firm with us during this storm. They come from all over the world, India, Brazil, South Korea, the USA, Canada, Germany, and we all have been able to work together and enjoy great moments of fellowship during this lockdown. We also had the opportunity to serve Tel Aviv by helping the municipality deliver food to those in need, help neighbors and other people, like a single mother who just had twin babies and no family nearby to assist her. It has been a nice and quiet season without guests, but at the same time, we have been very busy and still serving those around us. Despite the hard moment we are living in, we have learned that God is in control and that He has beautiful plans for each one of us. On the other hand, Beit Emanuel has been hurt financially. No guests means no income for the past three months. There are still bills and salaries to pay. So we covet your prayers for Beit Emanuel. We would like to open our doors very soon. Thank you so much, Pedro. That was absolutely amazing and just lovely to hear from you and to mm. understand about what's going on. Um, just to say that since that um, video was made, the guest house has reopened and is open to Israelis, which is wonderful news and provides a real mission opportunity. So do pray for that. But also because of COVID-19, the guest house has been um, impacted financially. And so I just wonder if, if you were um, moved by the video, if you feel particularly connected to this mission opportunity, um, would you prayerfully consider whether you might support um, financially? And if that's the case, can you um, get in contact with Claire Franks? Claire is our world mission pastor, and she will sort of en enable that connection. And her email address is coming up at the bottom of the screen. But uh, thanks again, Pedro, we really do appreciate it and we are praying for you. So on the subject of mission, we're now going to talk a little bit about local mission and I'm going to hand over to Henry and Ryan who are going to talk to us a little bit more about Ryan's plans for the future and what's happening on the Millbrook Estate. Over to you, Henry. Well, hello, Ryan. Hello. Uh, here we are on Millbrook Park, which yep. is where you live. Yep. Uh, and Ryan, you moved on from the staff of St. Bees about three years ago, and yet you've still been around. So what have you been doing? Oh, quite a few years ago, while I was working at St. Bees, I felt a strong call to explore ordination in the Church of England. Um, and I felt a strong call to this place going way, way back when I was doing a, a youth ministry placement at St. Bees, I worked with a group of lads who, who lived on this when it was the English Barracks Estate. Much later on, we began some mission work here with some friends. We started a youth club in the area, started some other bits of community work and family work, which are still ongoing today. I started my training at St. Melissa's College 
and we began via a placement of some bees looking at planting a church in this community. So here you are, a missionary church planter sent out from some bees, been on Milbrook Park now for nearly three years. Now even in the three years you've been here I think you've seen quite a lot of change. Tell us about Milbrook Park and the needs and uh, is, there any, is it needed that we have a church planted here? Very much so. I think way way back this was an army barracks, it then became social housing, um, it was then sold to developers. There's an, the original data suggested 2,500 new homes being built on here and that, that's, you know, that data is about five or six years old now, maybe more. And then an additional 500 homes being built on top of that. And then from observations again, I'd say that's increasing as families move into the area. So there's a huge need to engage with children, with young people, with families, um, with people who move into this area who are commuters. And there's no real community provision in the area outside of what existing churches already do. We want to plant quite a number of missional congregations, communities, churches. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Great opportunity. Yeah. So you're going to be ordained yep. um, uh, and you're, serve your curacy at St Paul's Mill Hill. Firstly, uh, we've got COVID lockdown. How is the ordination going to work? I was, I was supposed to have already been ordained as a deacon in the Church of England at St Paul's, but that's not happened, obviously. Uh, so instead, the, the date's been moved back to late September. And in the meantime, I've been ordained as a licensed lay minister. So I get to do a lot of you know, permission to do a lot of what I could have done before um, with a few caveats and a few significant things I'm not allowed to do yet because that comes with training. <laughs> Now you've been around some bees for quite a long time and yeah. you're now moving on. How do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, the relieved? <laughs> you're not <laughs> going to say that? <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but I think it's, it comes with a very positive angle in that I've been around some bees a long time and some bees has very much been a family space. And with family you, you laugh, you joke, you, you embrace and you wrestle and you cry and you rage at each other and there's there's very much been that relationship and I think that's because there's been a depth of relationship. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's a sort of bittersweet thing in a way. It's sweet that I, I need to move on, I need to grow, I need to change. Yeah, it's been it's been really good and I'm not, I mean, I'm just up the road really. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. So I do want to visit again. I yeah. still have friends at St Bees who I, I, I will be seeing again, will be learning from. Yeah. Great. Well, let me pray for you, Nuham. Father, I thank you for Ryan. I thank you for the call that you've put on his life uh, uh, to be a church planter. Uh, and as he steps out into ordination uh, and into his curacy, we ask that you would equip him with your Holy Spirit. You would uh, fill him with all the resources of the kingdom of God and that you would empower him to have faith to step out with you. We ask for your blessing on Ryan and on Georgia and Aurora and the family uh, and uh, Lord go with them, strengthen them and prosper the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. Great, thanks for that Henry and Ryan. I've got to say I'm going to miss Ryan quite a lot. It's been fun chatting to him about church planting and all that sort of thing but wish him all the best. I'm sure he's going to do an amazing job out there. On a similar note, we've actually um, been doing some consultancy um, with some of the people from St Bees about um, equality and um, asking people what's their interpretation of where we're at on equality and inclusion. Um, and what we've decided to do is actually look at uh, inclusion and equality in a wider breadth. So just looking at things like uh, how we're including women in ministry, how we're including the disabled, how we're including um, people of race and colour and people of different cultures and just want to and age actually as well and what we want to try and do is find ways that we're actually going to be able to include everybody in the services and have a truly reflective global church that is St Bees um, represented within our services so in the future we will be coming to do some um, focus groups and if you're interested in joining those focus groups feel free to email me about that
because we want to we want to get your input and find out how we can be best inclusive in the way we're doing church so that's coming up so if you've been wondering whether all that's gone to pot it's been definitely brewing and we're working on it hard and we will be doing these focus groups fairly soon um now over to about a new announcement we've got um something happening at the end of july let's watch the video and find out what's going on hey it's summer it's time for new wine got my tent got my wellies got my broken chair off we go Well, no, that's not going to happen like that this year. But something is happening. And here's Paul Harcourt to tell us a bit more. History tells us that whenever plague or persecution or famine has come upon the earth, the church shines. What if instead of being shaken, we're being shaped? What if we, the church, don't emerge from lockdown timidly and weary, but we break out, prayed up and fired up with a message of hope and healing that we've experienced for ourselves and that we're equipped and ready to share with a nation that's hurting. So new wine is happening, but it's happening online. Here are a few of some of our people from St Bees sharing their opinions on new wine. And last year we went to new wine for the very first time. Um, me personally, I really enjoyed it. I really liked, there was, liked how there was a space for young people to come together and to worship God. A place where you can encounter God through Bible-based teaching, amazing spirit for worship and spending time with your church family. What do we love about New Wine? Time. Time to worship, time to pray, time to encounter God, time to refocus. It's just an amazing atmosphere to just relax and get into God. Lots of people will tell you if they've been to New Wine how good the teaching and the worship is, and it really is, it really is top draw. Where I made some new friends, there were friendships that were formed. During the week I really press into God to hear from Him what He has for my life. And over the years He's really spoken into all, all sorts of aspects of my life, whether that's relationship, career, call. Um, I made loads of friends there. It was so friendly, like I made so many friends, everyone was so lovely and willing to talk about their experiences with God. I'm literally still friends with them now to this day. The great thing I've loved is building friendships with people. As a family, it was something that we all enjoyed and it helped us to, you know, come closer together. I like New Wine because it's really fun and we worship God at the same time. The group that I was in had a very lovely leader. He could always put stuff into perspective so we could understand it. So I really do recommend it as a place to push into God. Yeah, new wine's great. Yeah. So it's quite upsetting that it's not happening again this year. But new wine is happening. United Breakout is new wine's online summer conference from the 30th of July to the 3rd of August. It's got a full program, everything going on, and you can go without camping. Why don't you join with a group of friends in your garden or if lockdown restrictions relax perhaps even inside new wine is happening and it's a chance to really participate this is our time let's not miss it Great, so don't forget the dates, 30th of July to the 3rd of August. Right, we're off now to hear Luke speak, so over to you Luke. Hello, this morning greeting is taken from Jude verses 1 to 5. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace and love. Be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write 
and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Severian and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Good morning church, it's so good to be with you. If we've not met, I'm Luke, I'm the Young Adults Pastor here, uh, training to be a vicar, uh, and it's a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Let me pray as I start. God, may I speak in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I hope you're doing really well. Today we've got an exciting look at the book of Jude. So I want to ask you this question. Have you ever wanted to have your cake and eat it only to find you've already eaten it? It's a famous phrase, you want to have your cake and eat it. Uh, And it means that you cannot eat your cake twice. My favorite cake is carrot cake, 100%. Maybe you can write yours uh, in the comments. But it's a bit like this, isn't it? Let me give you some examples. You might want washboard abs, but you also might want to eat loads of Domino's pizza. You might want to wake up really early, feel fresh and ready for work, but you also might want to watch a late night series on Netflix. You can't really do both. Uh, And you might want to fast and pray like a Franciscan monk uh, all the time, day and night, but you don't want to miss meals and you've got loads of other stuff to do. You can't really do both. You can't really have your cake and eat it. It's what I'm going to call today the corruption of compromise. And Jude has a little something to say about that to us. But this means, doesn't it, guys? Sorry, I should have said. You finished Ezekiel. Congratulations. That's an achievement in itself. And now we're going to be looking at the small letter of Jude, which is just one chapter you'll be pleased to hear. But it's full of lots of uh, really big, meaty stuff. So it's going to get real this morning. I hope you don't mind. But um, yeah, so thank you for the reading we've already had. Uh, But you might want to flick to the letter, might want to have it open in your Bibles anyway, so you can refer to it. It's right near the back towards Revelation. So whilst you're finding that, let me just tell you a bit about the letter itself. So Jude is one of Jesus's biological brothers, which is pretty cool. Uh, So he must be all right. Um, And he was thought to be a traveling preacher or perhaps a missionary. And it's thought that he was writing this letter to a group of Messianic Jews, possibly a church. Um, And we know that they would have had a really good understanding of the Old Testament because Jude references a lot of that and some other Hebrew literature, such as the book of Enoch. And a fun fact, I learned that apparently it's pronounced Judah, although I'll say Jude because it's probably a bit less confusing. So we've already read the passage, those five verses. I'm just going to reread the second half of verse four, because that's really what I feel the Lord wants me to focus in on today. And I don't know if you caught the subtitle to this. It might read differently in your Bible, but in my Bible, it says the sin and doom of ungodly people. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy stuff. So let's see what we can do with it. So let me just read the second half of verse four. So we've, we've received the blessing from Jude, and then he gives this warning. He says, I really wanted to write to you about this idea of salvation. I had this big theological kind of thesis, this big essay to send to you, um, but I found out this thing, and I urgently need to write to you to talk to you about it, and this is what it is. He says they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. That is the crux of what we're talking about today. 
He's basically saying that people use this gift of grace that Jesus graciously gives us as like a get out of jail free card. And you might have a similar reaction to me like, gosh, that, that's awful. Taking that lovely gift that Jesus gave us and making it like a, a, a license for immorality. Sh shame, for shame. But I just first want to start by saying that it's a bit confusing, actually, the gift of grace. I'm sure we've all been, or you can imagine the RE classroom, this is what came to my mind, when the teacher has to explain the gift of grace um, that the Christian message speaks of to a room of students. And there was definitely that kid in my class who said something like this, Miss, Miss, just clarify. You're telling me that I can do what, whatever I like, anything at all, like I can kill someone, I can get drunk, all the, I can go to casino, I can be well cool, whatever I like, all I have to do is say sorry to God and he'll forgive me. That's what you're saying. And the teacher response is kind of like, well, yeah, kind of. So what I want to look at today is what's the kind of? What, what is that reaction you might have had when you heard that boy's response? Why is that not what grace is all about? So first I thought we could look at this idea of grace, try and really understand it because it's quite confusing, and then look at what it looks like to treat that gift of grace in the way that Jude speaks about, using it as a get-out-of-jail-free card, as a, a reason to sin because we know God will forgive us. So let's go. You may have heard the story of, of two young boys, best friends they were, joined at the hip, but they, they lost touch after school. The first boy, he, he went on to have a really successful law career. He even made it to the dizzying heights of being a judge. And the other boy, he didn't have such a good time. He ended up committing some pretty serious crimes, hitting on hard times. And he got caught and taken to a trial. And when he looked up at the trial, he saw his friend, the judge. They locked eyes and they realized that they were the very same boy that they were friends with when they were growing up. Now the judge, he had to carry on with the trial. And at the end, it came to sentencing. And the judge said, your crimes have cost thousands and thousands of pounds in damages. And we are gonna charge you lots of money uh, that you have to pay back. Otherwise, we're gonna have to sentence you to prison. And the, the man, he looked down, knowing he couldn't pay it. And after a few moments, he felt a hand on his shoulder. And when he looked up, he saw his friend, the judge. And in the judge's other hand, he had a check for well over 500,000 pounds that would pay the damages and let the man go free. It's amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing story. And it mirrors what Jesus does for us, God's gift of grace. You see, it's even better than that, though, because God doesn't just take the punishment that we deserve. He also gives us the reward that Jesus deserved for the life that he lived on this earth. It says in the Bible that he takes our sin, our guilt and our shame, those feelings we should feel when we sin, and he gives us the righteousness of Christ, the man who lived a perfect life, who is the son of God. And it's, it's important to note in the story that the judge had to do his job. He couldn't avoid giving a sentence. He has to be a judge, but he also uses his power for good, for our redemption and for our sake. So if we think about what Jude is saying, that we corrupt this idea of grace and we use it as a free ticket, it's a bit like if that man left court maybe broke some speeding fines on the way back home, uh, maybe stole something from a shop, grabbed a crowbar, went to the prison and just let himself in, jumped back on one of the bunks. And uh, when the guard says, hey, wh what are you doing here? He would say, well, don't you know? Didn't you hear? Judge, turns out, he's my friend. He, uh, he actually bailed me out this morning. He's pretty rich. He's probably going to do it again. So I'll give him a call in the morning and we'll, uh, we'll sort something out. It doesn't make sense to live that way. And I think that can be a little bit like what it looks like from the outside when we accept this gift of grace, yet we choose to walk back to sin. You know, when we try and have our cake 
and eat it. It's a corruption of compromise. But let me just go on by saying that it's hard. And let me be the first to say that. Let's just think about why sin is such a tempting cake. It's a, it's a regular metaphor, isn't it, that sin is like cake. And partly because when we do sin, it feels good. And it's important that we recognize that. Certainly at the time, it can feel really good. But we know that it's not the right way or the best way. And the other thing is that sin so easily entangles, doesn't it? A bit like your headphones, when you put them in your pocket, you take them out and it takes about an hour to get them untangled again. It says that in Hebrews, that sin entangles us. And I think one of the ways that sin does that is because maybe you're like me. I was taught from a young age that God, there's nothing I can do that will make God love me less and nothing I can do that will make God love me more. And so when I'm stood face to face with temptation, with sin, when I'm looking at it, this was definitely the case for me at university, you can almost hear that whisper from the enemy saying, well, you know, he did say there's nothing you can do that will make him love you less. We're drawn in, aren't we? But what happens when we get drawn into sin? Well, let's pretend like you're God. There you go, congratulations, you got the good part. Uh, and I'll be me. And when I sin, I put things in between me and God. So let's say there are these big boxes when I sin. I put one in front, I put the other in front, and I, I look up and catch a glimpse of God. And it reminds me to pray, turn to him, and I can clear, he clears those boxes out of the way by his grace. But what if we keep building those boxes and we lose sight of God? And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in prison. We start to get used to our surroundings and we forget to look towards God. Sin distorts our view of him. It's a bit like if that man in our story woke up one day and forgot that he was in prison. Those walls started to become a bit too familiar. And then the worst part is when you do remember you're back in prison, you realize that you're the one that broke in in the first place. One verse that really helped me to understand the corruption of compromise, why we cannot have our cake and eat it, is John 10.10, 10, where it says, the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come, Jesus has come to give us life and life in all of its fullness, life in abundance, life to the full. You see, I've tried both cakes and I'm telling you, Jesus is one, is, he, is, he is the star baker. He is the man when it comes to baking cakes. Um, it's just true, isn't it? When we start to follow the way of Christ, we, we see it for ourselves. That really is the way to fullness. Because it's important to note that grace isn't just a gift. It is a gift to us, but it's not like a birthday present that you enjoy, you open, you put it to one side. That's a nice thing for me. We need to start viewing grace for what it is. A moment, a truth, a shifting piece of history that has changed the way of everything, the way that we can live in this world and the way that we can interact with others. Sin uh, can be defeated, has been defeated forever. And grace reminds us of that. Jesus died for you and he died for me. Not so we can have this free pass to sin, but so that we can show the world that he is the king, that we can show the world how to live in this fullness of life, that we can stare the enemy right in the face and say, not today, not today. So do you remember what happened? We've done the story, you must have done it hundreds of times at Christmas and Easter. God was in heaven, wasn't he, with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They were having an amazing time. And we were down on the earth running riot. But he chose to leave that space, come down to earth as a, an asylum-seeking refugee baby, lying in a stable full of horse poop, cow poop, sheep poop, poop everywhere, straw, hay, not, not good for a baby. He lived a perfect life. 
And then the people that he came to save killed him in the most brutal way they knew how, made an example of him. And he did that to pay the punishment for the bad things that we do, that we deserve. And he took on those feelings of sin, shame and guilt that we deserved. He died and then after three days he rose again to beat death for good and to take away those feelings forever and give us the righteousness of Christ. And it's only when we understand the magnitude of this truth that we can become a church who keep our promises, tell the truth, fight against injustice, show the righteousness of Christ to those around us, who testify to the power of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. It's only when we really grasp this truth that we can do those things. And this is why Jude wrote urgently to this church. And it's, it's why we need to think about grace when we think about doing those sins that easily entangle you know because god is so much bigger than buying that lottery ticket or you know having that extra glass of wine or clicking on that private browser tab and, and searching for something you shouldn't the goodness of god i can't afford to put sin in the way of me and that because i need it to transform my heart so that i can be Jesus to the people around me and use the goodness of God to help transform the world around me. Because grace, grace is not a quick fix. Grace is not a fad. It's not just a, a little gift that we can use and check. It's not like a voucher. Grace, Jesus, Christianity, it's an unwavering truth that caused a cosmically consequential change in the fabric of time and in the history of humanity. And it is only by being a church who are fully on board with this truth that we can fully live out God's purposes for us here in North Finchley and beyond. We must be transformed by this God who stands above what merely feels right to us at the time. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when we start to play by the rules, when we start to fix the rules and, and, and have our cake and eat it, we become like the person who realises you can get cheaper train travel if you just buy a child's ticket until the inspector comes or the man who celebrates when his work accidentally pay him twice, he goes on holiday and then they ask for the money back. It's when we decide that we are the Lord of our lives that we run into trouble. And that's why Jude says, doesn't he, at the end of verse four, that we start to think that we are also a Lord. We forget Jesus is the only sovereign and Lord. And when we start to do this distortion, we become translators who abstract the ideas of Jesus instead of knowing that it's Jesus with his people. That is the outworking of grace. And we, we, we cannot just merely understand grace on a level of thinking. It must be in the way that we live because Christianity is an invitation to live in a way that wouldn't make sense without Jesus' death and resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit running through our veins. Do you follow that invitation? As Christianity as a life that is only made possible by Jesus Christ. It's really hard. Don't get me wrong, it's difficult. But when we look to Jesus, he can show us how we can do it. It says in, in John that he would only do what he saw the Father doing, John 5, 19. And Jesus, he knew how to live and he knew how to be in each situation because he was constantly listening to God, constantly walking with God. 
He knew when to party the wedding in Cana. He knew when to go off on a mountainside by himself. He knew when to work really hard, when to preach to people, when to pray quietly, when to challenge the authorities and the structures around him, when to submit to those same authorities. He knew when to wreck the joint, smash the place up, and he knew when to just sit down and enjoy a nice meal with friends. And the beauty of the gospel is that time and time again, Jesus reminds us that we're not alone. He's not left us alone to do this on our own back with our own skills. He gives us the Holy Spirit. It says John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever. In John 16, Jesus explains how he speaks to the Spirit after he hears from the Father and the Spirit speaks to us. So we have this direct access to God. And that is how we can engage in the truth of grace, put ourselves inside this massive story of God's idea to make the whole world new, to bring redemption. It's through the Father through the Son, through the Spirit, that we can do that. We can become a church who are faithful to their promises, who tells the truth, who loves the enemy, who fights against injustice, who honours the poor, and who testifies to the power and working of God today. So it's important that we are not corrupted by compromise. We don't get lured in by trying to eat two cakes when there's only one. We must have a whole life response to God's grace because that's what it requires. So join a life group, get into a two to four, talk about the struggles with sin that you have because we cannot let that rule us. There's a better way and we need to build rhythms that will protect us. Let me pray as we close. Just take a moment to just have a deep breath. Maybe close your eyes. Maybe open your hands out and just invite the Holy Spirit in once more. Holy Spirit, would you come? Jesus, I thank you that you've given us the gift of grace and it has changed everything. I pray that you would help us break out of that prison and just look you in the eyes and be loved by you. I pray right now for anyone who is struggling with um, a particular sin that you would break that in Jesus' name. Thank you that you forgive, that there is grace, Lord, and that you just want to love us. And God, for anyone watching who's not um, accepted that grace for the first time, Lord, I pray that they would just accept you right now and just invite you and just say, Jesus, you are Lord, not me. Come and fill my life. Amen. So I think there may be um, some people here who have got some business to do with God. I'd, I'd love it if you would click the live prayer button um, or, or turn to someone, phone someone up and just maybe confess some sin to them and to God and just ask for forgiveness once more. And if you want to invite Jesus into your life for the first time, then that is also the best thing to do. Pray with someone who you know uh, loves the Lord and they would love to do that with you. Amen. Thanks, Luke, for that. That was amazing. I loved your, your talk. Thanks for that. So we're coming to the end of our service now and we're going to have our final song. Um, but during that time, we've been praying for people and asking for God for words. And the ministry team will be putting those those words in the in the chat. So if any of those words apply to you, just click on the live link and just come and join um, our prayer team who will pray for you. But let me just close in prayer before we go. Father, we thank you that you are um, alive and you've proved yourself to be faithful to so many of us, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would speak to your children this week. As we leave the service for this week, Father, we just thank you that you are with us 
and you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So may the peace of God that passes understanding guard our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless, guys. Don't forget to come and join us for Zoom, coffee and chat directly after the links in the chat in your main prayer area. So God bless. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye. Bye. Choose to say, Lord, blessed be.